Did you know this was on the market? <laughs> hold me! Have oh, you, hold me! Have you got one of these for Molly? Uh, actually, uh, Steven Spielberg sent one over with a note that says, this is your worst nightmare. If you were between the ages of 2 and 10 in 1994, then odds are there are few movies you watched more growing up than The Flintstones. Even if you haven't watched this movie dozens of times, I at least guarantee that something about it still stands out in your memory. Alright, you spit it out! <laughs> From its stunning production design to its captivating creatures, The Flintstones is a movie where you can truly feel the hard work that went into it in every single scene. <gasps> Daddy, pretty. It's perfect. Yeah, it's a film production that we've simply seen nothing like since, except maybe the 2000 Grinch adaptation. And even those that avoided going to see this movie for whatever reason, were unable to escape its marketing campaign, as this movie was everywhere. Now you can get a Flintstones movie poster free! Yeah, Great oh, movie poster inside mock boxes of pebbles! There were action figures, a video game, trading cards, talking dolls, a pinball machine, comic books, not to mention a multi-million dollar promotion by McDonald's. Or should I say, Rock Donald's. The Barney Rubble Bacon Double Cheeseburger. This month only. At Rock Donald's today! When do we eat? It's a marketing blitz that paid off well, as the movie was a huge hit upon its release on Memorial Day weekend 1994. But while the movie dominated the box office, the critical consensus was less than lukewarm. What do kids care about? Office politics, right. hanky-panky with the secretary, yes. uh, adoption problems, yes. uh, mother-in-law problems, embezzlement. Kids don't know what embezzlement is. Uh -huh. But who is this picture intended for? You're absolutely right. Better than being a couple of petty ingrates. And it wasn't just the critics of 1994 that had a problem with it, as it seems many kids who watched this movie later turned on it as adults. It currently has a 5 out of 10 on IMDb, and a 25% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. They made a fool out of me. Well, but they had to work with <laughs> It has continued to be debated and argued over, even 30 years after its release. So go ahead, yell, scream, let the fur fly, give the neighbors something to talk about! Most of the critics at the time cited its convoluted plot and lack of character development as weak points. But as a kid, I always appreciated how this movie didn't dumb down its story. I don't need any help from you. I'm vice president of... The movie deals with Fred Flintstone being set up as the fall guy for a corporate embezzlement scheme. Even at a young age, I understood the plot and its stakes, though, and I respected the movie for having adult themes. I gotta think of something. And as far as the characters go, they always felt well represented to me, which is probably a testament to the great casting. I hear that eating too much red meat is bad for you. What a load of bug. My father ate it every day of his life. He lived to the ripe old age of 38. Watching the movie today, I'm amazed at how every single adult cast member completely commits to the material, as silly as it is, really elevating the movie. Promise me you won't say anything like you did when you saw my sister's baby. The kid had a tail. What was I supposed to do, pretend I didn't notice? This is all the more impressive considering a few of them, including the star, didn't really want to be there in the first place. And I've had to sport this bad haircut for the last three months and I'm about tired of it. But for every misstep this film takes, it's met by a dozen innovative approaches in bringing these characters and their world to life. Regardless of your feelings on the movie, it's a production that's worth exploring in detail. So let's journey back 30 years, which fittingly enough feels like 5 million years ago, to look at how the Flintstones movie came to be. Wilma, I'm home! Created by Hanna-Barbera, The Flintstones first hit airwaves on September 30th, 1960, and ran for six seasons. Though today it's remembered as a kid's show, at the time it was aimed at an adult audience, being the first ever animated sitcom to air in prime time, hence its laugh track. <laughs> Very funny, ha ha ha. The Flintstones even back then was widely accepted as being inspired by the Honeymooners. William Hanna was always honest about the show's inspiration, while Joseph Barbera claimed that it was never discussed when developing the concept, which is contested by the fact that Hanna Barbera hired two of Jackie Gleason's writers to work on the show. You are a blabbermouth! 
The movie leans far more into that honeymooner's influence. I don't need permission from my wife to make a decision. In my cave, I reign supreme. Supreme! I am the king in my castle. The king, Norton! The show became even more popular when it was sold to syndication beginning in 1966, especially amongst kids, when NBC began airing the show on Saturday mornings. The 70s and 80s were filled with various shows all trying to tap into the show's newfound popularity through syndication. While the original series had concluded with a big screen feature film, The Man Called Flintstone in 1966, plans for a live action adaptation did not begin until the mid-1980s. In 1985, producer Joel Silver acquired the rights to the characters and commissioned a screenplay by Beverly Hills Cop 2 scribe Stephen D'Souza for Richard Donner to direct. Jim Belushi was cast as Fred with Rick Moranis as Barney. D'Souza was later replaced though, and countless writers were brought in to write their own drafts. By 1991, five different versions of the movie had been written by eight writers. Why throw good money down the drain? Silver and Donner eventually walked away from the project, which resulted in Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment scooping up the rights. Spielberg had been inspired to develop a Flintstones movie since 1988, during the production of his movie Always, where he first got to work with John Goodman. We were doing a movie called Always, and Steven asked me, uh, he, no, he actually told me that I was going to play Fred Flintstone for him. And instead of smacking the little bugger, I just kind of sat there and smiled. And it's, uh, I'm, be honest with you, I'm a little nervous about it, because I think I'm going to hear Yabba Dabba Doo for the rest of my life. Yabba Dabba Doo! When Spielberg acquired the rights, he refused to produce the movie with anyone but John Goodman in the lead. I see. Though the star was less than enthused about the idea of playing a cartoon caveman. It just took the wind out of me. It's not something I was looking forward to doing. It, yeah, I felt like I was sandbagged. Spielberg decided to keep on Rick Moranis as Barney, though the rest of the characters would be cast from scratch. I was a blonde and I wore a dress for three months. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> you I would do it again in a second. <laughs> Amblin discarded all of the previous drafts of the screenplay and brought in writer Michael Wilson, who had worked on Little Giants for them, to write a new plot outline. From there, writing duo Tom S. Parker and Jim Genoine, who had written Richie Rich, wrote a new draft based on Wilson's outline. By this time, Spielberg had started vetting potential directors. He was eventually won over by Problem Child 2 and Beethoven director Brian Levant, himself a huge Flintstones fan, owning a large collection of merchandise and toys. As you can see, I'm sitting here with my entire Flintstones collection. Uh, and the Flintstones occupies an interesting place in my heart and in my life. And I thought that I should be the person to help translate that affection to the screen. Levant then brought in a series of sitcom writers to punch up the screenplay, an effort to be more evocative of the humor in the original show. This constant rotation of writers led to arbitration by the Writers Guild of America, who had to determine which of the whopping 35 writers who had worked on the story over the years deserved to be credited. This entire scheme was your idea. True. But I've graciously decided to give you all the credit. With the script still being finalized, Spielberg and Levant set about bringing Bedrock and its inhabitants to life. Production designer William Sandell was hired to take the world of the Flintstones from 2D animation to physical reality. Sandell, known for building immersive, fully functional sets in movies like Robocop and Total Recall, was the perfect man for the job. Everything has been uh, designed uh, and carved and painted as rock or bone or leather. The Bedrock set will be built on a popular filming location in LA, known as the Vasquez Rocks, over several weeks. Sandell's set consisted of 15 houses, as well as a downtown business area, not to mention fully functional Stone Age vehicles. <laughs> Sandell's work didn't stop there though, as he and his team were also required to build the movie's unique props, everything from big pieces like furniture to something as small as the silverware. Get me a clean spoon. And it's an attention to detail that makes this movie stunning to look at even 30 years later. Aha! <laughs> There's your problem right there. For the prehistoric creatures that would be populating the film, Spielberg wanted to again work with Stan Winston, who had designed and operated the animatronic dinosaurs for Jurassic Park. Winston's design concepts for the Flintstones were evidently closer in look to the realistic reptiles of Jurassic Park than the cartoonish style that ended up in the movie. 
Levant felt that Winston's designs lacked a certain whimsy, and he wanted to go in a new direction. He wanted Stan Winston to do them, knowing that they would be different. I met with the late Stan Winston, who did the Terminator and all the Jurassic Park stuff, and he's brilliant. I did not detect much whimsy. He found that new direction while watching a certain TV show with his kids. Honey, I'm home. After viewing their work on dinosaurs and similar projects, it was decided that Jim Henson's Creature Shop would be the perfect fit for the movie. Odds are, if anything has stayed with you from this film, it's one of the household appliance creatures. I'm the executive, you're the office equipment. If Ooh. I want to ask the office equipment for advice, I'll ask the water cooler. <laughs> As the puppeteers went above and beyond here, and got really creative in designing these animal props. We wanted the elements of whimsy and of fantasy and of magic that the cartoon has, but we didn't want anything to feel animated at all. It was very important to us that all of our creatures felt like they were live and performing as people with the actors. While the movie would use a sizable amount of puppets and animatronics, CGI would be used in scenes that required more mobility. This was provided by Industrial Light and Magic. All these companies came together to bring a zany cartoon world to life in an amazing way. Doesn't get any better than this. With the look of the film nearly finished, Levant finalized the rest of his cast, including Elizabeth Perkins as Wilma and Rosie O'Donnell as Betty. <laughs> Upon finding out that Rosie would be playing his wife, Moranis allegedly remarked, she should be playing Fred. <laughs> it better be. <laughs> Though he later warmed to her casting upon meeting her. One minute people are your best friends, and the next you're fantasizing they're being ripped apart by a pack of rabid wolves. Kyle MacLachlan was cast as the film's villain, Cliff Vanderclave, with Halle Berry as the femme fatale. Believe it or not, the one who scored the highest was Fred Flintstone. That big ape? No, the big ape got a 65. Levant also sought to pay tribute to the original series by having Harvey Corman, who voiced the Great Gazoo, as the voice of the Dictabird. Dicta what? Dictabird! Read my beak! Ah. A Henson puppeteer supplied the character's voice on set, with Corman later painstakingly mimicking the performance in voiceover while adding his own inflection. What a strategist. Archive footage of Mel Blanc was also used as the voice of Dino. <laughs> The movie was populated with big names and supporting roles and bit parts as well, such as Jonathan Winters. I'm sorry, I'm sorry! <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor. I got half a mind. Oh, don't flatter yourself. That's it! Where's my club, Wilma? And Jay Leno. The case of the embezzling executive. William Hanna and Joseph Barbera would also get cameos. I know I'm the new man here, but I don't think you hired me just to sit around and look pretty. Even the supporting characters, such as Fred and Barney's bowling buddies, are perfectly cast. What you got today? Those are onions. What half? Sure. In watching any behind-the-scenes footage, you can tell how much fun it was on set, which definitely enhances the performances. Waka waka woo! 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 Picky picky picky! Pokey pokey pokey! God. But it's the it's still the walk of walk. I can pretty much walk 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 kiss that Ibsen festival walk. goodbye. <laughs> you can critique the plot and other elements, but the acting truly shines here. Your secretary is very attractive. Really, I hadn't noticed. Did I mention she chisels eighteen words a minute? Hmm. Goodman and Moranis in particular are fantastic. Watching them in any of their scenes together, you can tell what an absolute blast they were having in these roles. And I love you, Betty. Hey, all right. And I love the You can see from watching two minutes of John Goodman why his casting was make or break for Spielberg producing this movie. This in the big shot's feet, not Fred Flintstone. Why, good afternoon, Mr. Vandercave. My, that's a handsome belt you're wearing today. Levant and DP Dean Cundy expertly find ways to homage the style of the cartoon without it feeling forced. There's a lot of inventiveness in the physical gags and the way this movie was shot. 
With production underway, Universal started plotting out their marketing campaign. They decided to approach it similarly to how they marketed Jurassic Park, which was basically this. They put the picture's name on everything! Merchandising! Merchandising! The McDonald's tie-in for Jurassic Park had proved lucrative, so Universal set about doing the same with the Flintstones. McDonald's is turning back time a few million years, so starting Friday, you can go back to Bedrock for Flintstones fun and mammoth values. Welcome to Rock Donald's. May I chisel your order? A Stone Age-themed McDonald's named Rock Donald's was built on set, both to appear in the movie and for McDonald's to use in their own ads. McDonald's shot their commercials while the movie was in production, using the same film sets and props. They even got Rosie O'Donnell to appear in one of them. You can bring home special Stone Age souvenirs for uniquely chiseled bedrock mugs. These will look great with my bone china. Uh -huh. They're made of the latest Stone Age material, glass. Truly, their best marketing move was bringing back the McRib to tie into the movie, though. The Grand Puma super sized meal at Rock Donald's. A juicy McRib sandwich smothered in tangy sauce. <laughs> And unlike Jurassic Park, which had been deemed too scary for Happy Meal toys, the Flintstones was a natural fit for their kids' meals. Speaking of kids, Mattel secured the rights to make toys for the movie, though they only had a few months to design and produce all of them, as they wanted to show them off at that year's toy fair. Mattel didn't even have a screenplay to work off of, as it was still being written, which resulted in them having to invent toys that had nothing to do with scenes in the movie, like Big Bite Fred or Dino Drilling Barney. Ooh, pricey. Be sure to put that on your expense account. This is also why their action figures looked like a weird hybrid between the cartoons and the movie versions, as Mattel didn't even know what the characters would look like beyond the actors' likenesses. Also, I have my Fred. You have your... Uh -oh. Look how nice it yeah, is. Yeah, it's Luke Costello. It does look a little Luke Costello-ish. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's, that stuff never moved too well. I know. Gotta pick this up downstairs. <laughs> You got my Betty. Yeah. Oh God, what a sad looking. Look at how, this is like Betty on some sort of steroids. That's Look how like, tough that Betty is. That's... The highlight of their toy line was a talking Fred doll, which Goodman seemed to be faced with constantly on the publicity tour for this movie. But it's not your voice, is it? These will go big in Haiti for those voodoo specials. Oh yeah? yeah. <laughs> and it's anatomically correct. It's estimated that an additional $45 million was spent to market the movie, which was pretty equal to the movie's budget. In the buffet of life, there are no second helpers. You're gonna fill up your plate, top off your cup, and stuff a few rolls in your pocket. <laughs> it's a marketing choice that really paid off, though, as despite the negative reviews it received upon release, the movie became one of the highest-grossing films of the year. At the time, it held the record for the highest-grossing movie released on Memorial Day weekend, beating the previous record holder, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it seems everyone involved in the movie had expected it to do well, as Amblin even started planning two sequels that would be filmed back-to-back -back before the sets were torn down. And are you thinking about the possibility of a sequel for this? I'm not thinking of anything. I just, I just want to get through my next project. <laughs> But then John Goodman met with Steven Spielberg, and humbly requested not to be involved in any subsequent movies. I'm sorry. Goodman, who had only really acted in the movie as a favor to Spielberg, did not want to be known as Fred Flintstone for the rest of his career. Were you a little bit like Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver? Do you stand in front of the mirror going, yabba dabba do? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just to put your mind at ease, no. Spielberg understood and released him from any obligation to further Flintstones movies. This is why when a follow-up did materialize in 2000, they chose to make it a prequel with an all-new cast. This is a movie worthy of covering in its own video, though. I am here to observe your species' mating rituals. So, get to it! <laughs> oh, Bonnie and me don't, uh... Adapting a cartoon into live action is always difficult to pull off, but few adaptations have committed to bringing an animated world to life like this one did. It may have prioritized the look and feel of Bedrock over the story, but so what? At least we can look at any scene and actually feel all the hard work that went into it. If this movie were made today, the entire Bedrock set would have been assembled using CGI, as it would have been used to design every single creature as well. 
Even the marketing behind this movie is commendable, and just unlike anything we've seen in the past 20 years. Everyone involved was committed to bringing this world to life, and it all just feels so lived in and real as a result. Oh, really? But you know what feels even more real in this movie? The friendship between Fred and Barney. But for my friend, the special part is what's behind his ribs. His heart. <laughs> A lot of that is owed to the absolutely perfect casting and performances of John Goodman and Rick Moranis. But Brian Levant is also owed a debt of gratitude for how he managed to respect the character's cartoon essence while also grounding them as real people. I'm only one man. Not from the back. <laughs> the heart of the movie rests on the relationship between these two characters. And when you set that against the backdrop of incredible production design and effects, I'm really left saying this movie is truly not that bad. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, that's rich! So if you're looking for something to watch that will remind you of being a kid again, fill up your commemorative Rock Donald's mug and raise a glass to the Flintstones. Ah! <laughs>